Yeah, so hi everybody also on YouTube and welcome to the final One We Minds seminar of this semester. Uh, this talk will be given by Guido Montefar. Um, he is currently at UCLA and the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig. Uh, he also received his PhD from the university in Leipzig. Um, he has received numerous awards and uh, grants and written many articles within the area of machine learning with a, with a certain flavor of algebra in there. With that, I don't want to eat up more time uh, of Guido, so the floor is yours. The talk is called Geometry of Memoryless Stochastic Policy Optimization in Infinite Horizon Points. Okay, yeah. Um, Thank you so much, Axel, uh, for the kind introduction. And uh, it's uh, truly a pleasure to speak here at the last uh, session of the seminar for the semester. Okay, so this talk is um, presenting work uh, mostly done together with Johannes Müller, who is here at the audience, and um, which has led to um, very fruitful collaborations mm -hmm. more recently also with Marika Dressler, Marina Garrote Lopez, and uh, Kemal Rosem. And some of this work uh, is building on things that um, we did in the past uh, um, with uh, Johannes Rao, Kayan Razi Saheri, and Nihat Ai. Okay, so um, the setup here is that uh, we're considering an agent that is uh, interacting with an environment. And uh, so we think of this agent as um, perceiving some or, or sensing uh, something about this environment, making some observations, and then um, based on those observations, uh, choosing some actions. Um, and the actions uh, influence the environment and in turn also the future observations. And what we want to do is to optimize this action selection mechanism, uh, which we call a policy. Now the challenge here is that, of course, um, when uh, the agent is interacting with the environment, so every time it needs to make a decision, but um, uh, the, the, the situations or the observations um, um, that will um, necessitate an action um, will be affected by those actions in the future. So this is different from, say, a traditional uh, supervised learning setting where um, the type of inputs that are being observed uh, are always the same or follow the same probability distribution uh, independent of, um, of what the actions are. So that's kind of um, the, the, the difference here. Um, and this is uh, um, maybe two examples. Um, this one is uh, a hexapod uh, that we worked on uh, some time ago where Maybe the sense, the sense, um, the sense, the um, states or the observations here are the um, angular positions of the joints, and the actions are the torques that are applied to those um, uh, joints. Um, maybe with an objective to um, to have this uh, to locomote. Uh, uh, so at the rim position, the agent has to decide how to choose the torques um, so that it will uh, end up. Uh, creating a coordinated motion. Another situation here is maybe a grid world um, where there is this uh, environment and maybe an agent is uh, supposed to navigate this maze and maybe reach uh, a state where there is a, a reward. Now it may happen that this agent doesn't get to observe the entire maze um, at once, but it only observes uh, the adjacent cells. So it needs to choose um, which direction to walk based only on the adjacent cells. And that of course uh, can make it uh, difficult. So navigating a maze is difficult when we are in the maze, but not necessarily when we're looking at the maze from the top. And this is one of the you know, maybe main aspects of, of this work uh, where we were interested in the question of what happens when we have limited ability to recognize uh, the state of the entire environment and we are only choosing the actions based on these um, observations. Now, formally, uh, the way we think about this is as a Markov process. 
So we will have a set of states. Uh, these are modeling uh, the world or the environment. And um, we will also have a set of actions. And uh, so I'm gonna get to the observations in just a second, but uh, we're thinking that if we have a particular state at time t, uh, then um, we're going to be able to select an action uh, that is a conditional probability distribution condition on that state. So it's gonna give us a probability distribution over actions. And um, then the state together with uh, that action uh, will generate the next state. And uh, this is gonna be a transition that we denote by alpha. This is kind of the dynamics of this environment that is affected by the way that the actions are selected. Uh, this is called a Markov decision process where we can optimize this pi, this conditional probability distribution. Yeah, that's our policy. Now in the partially observable Markov decision process, uh, we don't get to select the actions based on the state of the environment, but um, we are first um, taking an observation that is another random variable here um, at every time step uh, based on the state. Um, so maybe in contrast to what we had before, maybe before we had this channel going from the state to the action, and now we have this intermediate step. So we can still think about the composition of the observation and the policy as, um, as mapping from states to actions, but, but this um, policy, this um, effective policy is restricted in the sense that it is required to factorize uh, with one of the factors being this observation mechanism. And uh, in this work, we're thinking about a fixed observation mechanism. Maybe the sensors of this agent are fixed, um, but maybe the, the perceptual capacity is um, sort of fixed and what we're optimizing is just this policy. We will see that uh, depending on the properties of beta, uh, this can have uh, uh, differences in the optimization problem. And that's the part that we're interested in here. Right, so where does the optimization problem come from? And uh, as I mentioned, our objective is to uh, find action selection mechanisms that are good or optimize them. Now, the idea is that this agent is going to receive an instantaneous reward, uh, R, uh, for taking an action A at a state S. So this is a function that maps from the set of states and actions to the reals. And our objective is to optimize the expected long-term reward. So there are two versions of this uh, that are very commonly used. Um, one is the expected discounted reward. It has this definition here. And what we're doing is we're taking this instantaneous reward that is obtained at time t for selecting the action at at state st, and we're summing that over time. And then uh, since the, so these guys S and A, they are random variables. So what we're gonna do is take the expectation over uh, all the trajectories uh, themselves. If we're given an initial state distribution, we have an initial distribution over the states and we fix our policy pi, this is gonna generate um, probability distribution over the trajectories. And we take the expectation with respect to that in this definition, we have this discount uh, factor, gamma to the power t, and that is um, a number uh, between zero and one, and is discounting the rewards into the future. And um, it has the um, convenient property that this um, sum uh, or this series um, uh, will, will converge nicely. Um, all right, so that's for the expected case. Uh, maybe the intuition would be that we care more about the instantaneous rewards that we receive um, now and maybe less about the rewards that we receive uh, far into the future. Uh, nonetheless, one may also care about an expected mean reward where instead of discounting those guys, uh, one takes just the, uh, the regular mean uh, over all the time steps. And so that would be this case. And uh, then one takes a limit as the time goes to infinity for the case that we're looking at here, which is an infinite horizon. Uh, this can lead to some technical um, 
difficulties, and uh, but there are well established conditions under which um, this quantity is well defined. Um, Maybe I can point out that uh, in some cases, uh, this type of object here will no longer depend on the initial state distribution. If, for example, we have um, that this Markov process that emerges from um, our system um, has a unique stationary state distribution um, for any choice of the policy, then maybe we can have here a function that um, does not depend on the initial distribution of states. Um, but in the case of the discounted um, rewards, so since we are considering more heavily the things that happen near the start, uh, the start state distribution will um, play a more significant role, and and it will, uh, you know, this function will typically depend on that initial state distribution. Okay, so what is the <laughs> the situation? What is the motivation here? A couple of years ago. Um, so we, we were looking at this um, situation that it was known uh, for a while that uh, Markov decision processes where the agents observe the state entirely and they have optimal policies that are memoryless and deterministic. So if you look at these um, uh, objective functions that I present in the last slide, uh, you can optimize them uh, without having uh, so by and, and by using policies that actually only um, care about the current observation, the current state, and that um, are always the same at every time point. So so they don't depend on time, and they don't take the history of past observations into consideration. Um, on the other hand. Um, in the case of partially observable Markov decision processes. Um, we may um, find memoryless stochastic policies that, uh, excuse me, I did mention about the deterministic part. The deterministic part was that uh, the actions that we select at every, at every state uh, is always the same, it's deterministic. So there is no randomness in there. Um, but in the case of partially observable Markov decision processes, um, there may be memoryless policies that randomize the actions and which do strictly better than any memoryless policy that is deterministic. So in a sense, uh, randomizing our behavior allows us to do better um, in the case that we don't have memory. And that's interesting. And um, I will show you a figure in, in just a moment, an example. Now the question, natural question here that arose uh, is um, do these on DPs, uh, partially observable um, NDPs have optimal memoryless policies that are more or less deterministic. So since in the case where we get to observe the entire state, we get to choose uh, actions deterministically, is there a sort of sort of a transition so that when we more or less know the state, uh, we can also choose the actions more or less deterministically. And we were able to answer this question uh, positively. And uh, in our first work, uh, we showed that it is possible to choose the actions deterministically at every observation that fully identifies the state. By that, I mean that uh, if we, so we're making these observations, but if it should be the case that one observation is only possible uh, from a particular state, uh, from only one state, then we, we can, um, choose the actions at that observation deterministically. So it was our first step. <clears throat> then uh, we were able to generalize this and show that uh, it is only needed to randomize uh, at most k actions at any observation that identifies the state up to k possibilities. Um, interesting about this is that <clears throat> the actions that need to be randomized here potentially do not correspond to the actions that the agent would have chosen if the agent had known the underlying state. Uh, the reason being that if, if one is not certain about the state, um, one may need to be more cautious about the actions. So instead of choosing uh, a randomization of the actions that one would pick with certainty if one knew the state, maybe one randomizes 
among some other more conservative actions that have a, a smaller risk of a catastrophic out outcome. So even though uh, these numbers match up, the relationship of the chosen actions is not necessarily obvious. Uh, later on, we were able to further uh, improve this result and obtain a, a somewhat more, more complicated um, statement, um, but is a, a little bit sharper. And the reason why we were trying to figure out what is the smallest amount of randomization that is needed is because um, if you think about the universe of all policies, and that is our domain where we are optimizing, um, those policies that are deterministic, they form a subset that is uh, much smaller. And so if we can identify properties of um, the problem, uh, based on which we can conclude that there will exist optimal policies in some smaller subset of the search space, then uh, we could, um, in principle, restrict the search to those subsets. And so maybe this will make it easier to uh, find a, an optimal policy. And if you take this to the extreme, you would say, uh, you know, maybe, uh, so given some properties of the problem, uh, give me a restriction on the set of uh, possible solutions. So in the extreme, you would say the restriction would be give me a list of all the optimal solutions and this would correspond to a complete specification of the problem. But if we give just a partial specification of the problem, such as you know, what is the amount of observability of the state, then to what extent can we restrict the set of candidate solutions? That, that was the kind of, um, of problem that we were looking at. Now, this is the promise illustration. Uh, so we have the MDP, we get to observe the maze from the top. Uh, we know exactly where we are standing. We know it's pretty clear to see that the optimal path towards uh, reaching this goal is to walk uh, uh, in this, in this, along this, this line. But if we were in this uh, situation where we have only partial observations, we only observe the adjacent cells, of the maze. So in that case, uh, this position here looks the same as this position over here. And we can no longer choose the deterministic actions for, you know, whenever we observe this T, if we were always to turn left, then uh, we would get stuck in here. Uh, if we were always to turn right, then here we are walking the right way, but here we would turn right again. And so since this is deterministic, we would never reach uh, that reward. So that illustrates the necessity to randomize actions at those states where uh, we cannot tell for sure um, you know, what the state is. Uh, so by the way, um, I am more than happy to take your questions. Uh, if you have any comments uh, during the talk. All right. Um, now, uh, so what was the, you know, a general approach to this problem uh, was to observe that, um, so this uh, objective function that we're looking at, even though it was complicated and it is the sum of all these instantaneous rewards, um, if we just rewrite it uh, in a smart way, so where we, instead of having this sum over time with the probabilities of all those um, different states uh, and actions, so we, we, we just, decide to call this object um, eta. And uh, we can observe that this eta actually is the probability distribution of the states and action, state and action pairs. So if we, if we just rewrite that objective um, by taking that probability distribution over states and actions, then this becomes an inner product of this instantaneous reward function and that eta. There's an expected value for a probability distribution only over states and actions without the time anymore. And of course, uh, this is now a linear function of this eta. Uh, so to be a little bit more precise, this state action probability distribution, we're gonna be calling it state action frequency here. So in the case where we have this uh, mean rewards, so this would correspond uh, precisely to the stationary a state action distribution for the fixed policy pi. In the discounted case, uh, the, this corresponds to a sort of 
discounted stationary uh, probability distribution uh, because we're discounting the observations of states uh, into the future. Um, well, so, you know, the main idea was to say, all right, so instead of looking at this um, objective that we don't know, at least at the time, what was the behavior, we could look at this objective and uh, which is linear. And now, so we have a linear problem at hand. And what we need to do is to study the feasible values of eta and then try to understand how the feasible values correspond to policies. So this is an illustration of what uh, that might look like. So when we're doing this as stochastic policies, we're looking at finite state spaces and finite action spaces. Uh, these are conditional probability distributions. So these are stochastic matrices. And um, in the case of a two by two stochastic matrix, um, you can imagine that, uh, so since every row of the matrix has non-negative entries that need to add up to one because they have to be probability distributions. Uh, so we only need to specify one of the numbers. So for every row, and those numbers will be between zero and one. So the space of two by two stochastic matrices corresponds to two numbers between zero and one. So this is a square and that's the square that I am showing you here. Um, and I'm plotting here the level sets of the um, objective function. And as you see, uh, it certainly is nonlinear. Uh, however, if we were to map this into the space of the corresponding um, state action frequencies, then uh, this square maps into this other shape. And over here, the objective function is linear. So the level sets are hyperplanes. And this is, uh, from this perspective, it is quite natural to, to conclude. If we know that this thing is actually a polytope, uh, if the objective is linear over a polytope, we know that one of the vertices will be an optimizer. And um, it turns out that those vertices, uh, in fact, correspond to the deterministic policies. And that's also not too difficult to observe. So those stochastic matrices, which have entries being either equal to zero or one, those are the vertices, and those are also the deterministic policies. Um, now, what happens is that as the degree of observability goes down, so these, um, well, the, certainly the, the objective function seems to change a little over this um, domain, um, but in the space of state action frequencies, it's clearer what's going on is that this set is being kind of restricted in a way because we have this factorization property of the policy, as I was mentioning. So we no longer, we can no longer represent all the policies from states to actions, but um, we have to go through that, that sort of bottleneck and this restricts the class of effective policies that we can um, represent. And, and the objective function still is linear, but the optimization domain becomes nonlinear. And it may be that the optimizer is sitting at the higher dimensional side. And if we can um, describe the dimension of the sites that will contain those optimizers, we can draw conclusions about the degree of stochasticity that is needed um, for acting optimally. Um, <clears throat> so what we were able to do at the time is to observe that there are two types of constraints. Uh, for one, there is a constraint that pertains to the stationarity. So we have this um, probability distribution and uh, it in a way corresponds to this discounted stationary probability distribution. If you have a Markov process and you want to know uh, the stationary distribution, they will form a um, it will satisfy a constraint, a condition that depends on the transition kernel of the process and uh, that determines some constraint. Um, but there is also the constraints that come from this factorization of the um, effective policy and um, those end up being nonlinear. Uh, so we understood that this part is linear, uh, but this part was something else. Um, nonetheless, so, so the, ultimately the, the intersection of these two constraints is some set in this case is this curve. And that is the feasible set of uh, state action frequencies. 
what we could do is decompose that set into a bunch of convex pieces. And um, each of those convex pieces was in fact a polytope. And for each of those, over each of those, we could conclude where is the optimum is in a phase of, a, of in a vertex. And so if we have some idea of um, the dimension of this, um, the composition of the pieces, we could also conclude uh, on the, um, on the dimension of the sides of this uh, overall domain uh, where we would uh, be guaranteed to find um, optimizers. Uh, we actually took this a couple of steps further um, in that uh, we also identified um, uh, a sort of um, policy improvement cones and those are cones of directions in the space of possible policies along which the objective function would always improve. And uh, so based on these things, we, we obtained those results that I mentioned a moment ago. Now, more recently, and this is the part that got me very excited, um, especially uh, this year. So with Johannes, uh, we started looking at this question, which is, um, you know, can we say something more specific about the structure of the objective function over the policies? And then also, can we actually provide um, an accurate description of the feasible set of state action frequencies? And indeed, uh, what we were able to do is show that um, first, uh, the state action frequencies, but also the objective function are rational functions of the policy. So it means that these are quotient of polynomials in the components of this uh, stochastic matrix. And moreover, the degree of these polynomials is directly related to the degree of observability. So the less observable the state is, the higher um, the degree. And um, we obtain uh, explicit semi-algebraic descriptions of the feasible uh, state action frequencies. Uh, I'm gonna say some more about that in a moment, but essentially what this means is, you know, when you are doing constraint optimization, you formulate the constraints um, not necessarily in a parametric way, but in terms of some equations that need to be satisfied and some inequalities that need to be satisfied. And that's the type of description that we obtain for um, the set of, um, of state action frequencies. Uh, based on this, um, we can formulate um, a POMDP generalization of the linear programming um, MDP. And uh, also bound the number of critical points and components of the super level sets of the objectives. So we can make um, statements about uh, the complexity of, um, of the objective function uh, in that way. So here is the picture, uh, more or less what's going on. So uh, as I already mentioned, this uh, square could correspond to the two by two stochastic policies. And uh, we're noting that with this notation, so this is a simplex of probability distributions over actions uh, conditioned on the observations. And maybe you have a policy here, pi. And uh, when we're thinking about these observations, we can imagine that this is a sort of an embedding into a space of policies that are mapping from states to actions. So we call this state policies uh, and observation policies. And um, the space of all state policies is this entire polytope. And uh, we get a constraint, a, a restricted subset, which are those policies that satisfy this factorization property. And it turns out that uh, this embedding is, is linear. And so this is again a polytope in here. Um, and then we have this mapping that is taking those policies and transforming them to this stationary distributions or state action frequencies. And this is a rational map. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the whole set of state action state policies is mapped to some other polytope over here. But once we look at a subset thereof, that subset no longer maps to a polytope, but it maps to this curvy set. And uh, that's actually the set of um, feasible state action frequencies that we want to to think about and characterize. I should mention that if we have an MDP, 
that corresponds to us not having observations, but rather operating over here, over this entire polytope. And then the set of feasible state action frequencies is a polytope again. So therefore, um, you know, since the objective function is linear over here, we have a linear program. And these are the kind of things that people have known for, for a long while now. Um, what is different for us is that we now have this constraint set. And uh, so even though the objective is linear, the domain is not, um, is not a polytope. Uh, so this is just some more illustration of what the objective function may look like over the space of uh, observation policies, state policies, or over the space of uh, state action frequencies. And, and you can you know, nicely see the illustration here. Maybe uh, if the domain here is this blue region, you may have these two optimizers, uh, maybe this other point here. So you know, it's, a more, it's certainly a richer optimization problem that emerges. All right, so I want to tell you a little bit about the parametrization and then this visible set and the number and location of critical points. Um, and then uh, maybe tell you uh, about a couple of um, experiments. Okay, first of all uh, is this notion that, so we have this mapping that so once we fix a policy, a memoryless stochastic policy, um, then this will give us um, state action frequency. So we have this mapping from policies to state action frequencies, uh, or also we have the mapping uh, to the uh, frequencies of the states alone. Uh, this is uh, just taking a marginal of this guy to look only at the state. And um, we may also be interested just in the mapping um, in the objective function itself, um, or also here the value function uh, that corresponds to our objective for um, the collection of choices of the initial state distribution being um, concentrated at every one of the possible states. So the value function is a vector valued uh, function where every component corresponds to this uh, accumulated reward when the initial state distribution is um, uh, is every one of the of the states of the system. Um, all right. So, and all these functions, they are rational functions um, of the components of the stochastic matrix that we're using as a policy, and they have a common denominator in the entries uh, of this policy matrix. Moreover, um, if we restrict them to policies which agree with a fixed policy on all states outside a subset of, um, excuse me, all, uh, all observations outside a subset of observations, uh, they will have a degree that is bounded in some way. So we look uh, uh, so here at the degree bound, uh, it is telling us, let's look at the, observations so let's add for an observation what are the states that that could lead to that observation with a positive probability so we're looking at that collection of states that are compatible with observations in that set o and that total number of states that are compatible with those observations will be a bound on the degree so this is the way in which we are relating the complexity of the optimization problem to the degree of observability. So because uh, the fewer states are compatible with an observation, um, the better the observability and the more states are compatible with an observation, the more diffuse uh, the situation is and the lower the observability. And we also have several refinements of this. Okay, so maybe one uh, interesting conclusion to draw from that statement is that, um, once you know that these are rational functions, we can conclude that the um, uh, image uh, of a polytope will be a semi-algebraic set. And that means that we can describe it in terms of um, polynomial equations and polynomial inequalities. And something similar also happens for the level sets. So we have a hope to, to be able to describe those feasible sets in terms of polynomials. Okay, um, uh, another corollary or conclusion from there is, well, it's not so easy to obtain that, but um, 
if you look at um, this degree one rational functions, then they have nice properties like a sort of monotonicity um, from which it is possible to conclude that if you, uh, you know, you can start optimizing the policy by moving along um, particular directions and it will be monotonic along those directions. And uh, you, you will be able to conclude that there exists an optimal memoryless policy that is deterministic on every observation that identifies the state uh, uniquely. Um, and this is one of the statements that I showed you a couple of slides back, uh, but back then we obtained it uh, with much sweat and using different methods, um, whereas here that came out in a much more transparent way. All right, so another thing that uh, we were able to do here is to obtain a refinement of a work by Tadashi and co-authors, uh, which they call the line theorem. The line theorem, what it refers to is, um, let's imagine that you decide to adjust your policy by changing it uh, only at a particular state. And so they were looking at MDPs, so they didn't have the partial observability, but let's say you fix a particular state and you adjust the um, probability distribution for that particular state uh, and you walk along a line. So what they, what they concluded or what they observed was that if you track what happens with the value function, again, this is a vector, um, it will also trace a line in the space of possible value functions. And this is interesting because the mapping from policies to value functions is not linear. Um, and yet, so you trace a line in the space of policies and this will create a line in the space of value functions. So they call this the line theorem. And what we were able to do is obtain the interpolation speed. So that's the same in here in the second bullet point. Um, so if we uh, are connecting policies pi C1, pi one um, by a line, then the value functions will also be connected by a line that is described like this, but we also have the interpolation speed uh, described in this way. Um, all right, so, but, you know, a generalization of this is uh, for the case where we have maybe partial observability, if we are not fixing the policy everywhere, but in one state, but rather we're allowing to move the policy on K states, then this will trace some piece of a curve. Uh, so this interpolation, will be a curve of degree at most k. Okay, so that's about the parametrization. So the notion that this is uh, rational and that uh, we can describe the degree of that rational function. Now about the feasible set. Um, first, uh, so in order, so what we care about is this set over here because the optimization problem over there is linear. Um, in order to get there, we first need to describe this um, set of um, feasible state policies. And as I mentioned, this is not terribly hard in the sense that this is a linear image of a polytope. Nonetheless, characterizing images of polytopes under linear maps is not uh, always possible. So even though we have uh, algorithmic approaches to doing that, if we want to have a general answer um, or a formula, we need to impose some conditions on those linear maps, for example, that they are invertible. Um, here, we will assume, you know, for the sake of obtaining a, a, an explicit description, um, we will assume that this uh, observation is a stochastic matrix that has linearly independent columns. And nonetheless, the later discussion applies also for other cases. Uh, and in this case, so we can describe that set of effective policies in this way. It's gonna be the intersection of the state policies of the yellow set with um, two types of constraints. One is this linear condition that has something to do with the kernel of that matrix of observations. And the other one are inequalities, linear inequalities, and they are described in this fashion, also depending on the observation. Um, so I guess it's that description. And um, okay, so that's our first step. Um, next step is, is gonna be for us to try and understand how these um, subsets uh, map into subsets over here. Um, 
but we also need to understand what is this linear space, this yellow set over here. So maybe we start with that, and that is the set of state action frequencies of MDPs, where we don't have the partial observability. And in that case, the description I mentioned, this has something to do with stationarity, and it is possible to um, extract a description based on that. So if you say, I want that upon applying my transition kernel, the probability distribution remains the same. Uh, if you work it out, you will see that this imposes a linear condition on the entries of that distribution. And so this ends up determining uh, some linear equations. So this defines um, a linear space or a linear constraint, uh, let's say. And that's our characterization of this uh, yellow set in here, uh, which also explains since it is an intersection with um, a simplex of probability distributions that uh, the entire thing will be a polytope. Um, next step is to look at um, the blue part. And uh, in order to do that, what we did was to investigate how um, linear spaces in the space of state policies map to subsets in the space of state action frequencies. And that um, gave us this characterization where we have the yellow set intersected with um, these two other objects that correspond to the linear equality constraints um, over here and to the linear inequality constraints. So now the constraints are given by polynomials and uh, they are multi-homogeneous polynomials and that come from the equations and from the inequalities. And moreover, we have this correspondence between the phase lattices uh, of that set, of, of these two sets, which actually also correspond to the phase lattice of the, of the initial policy polytope, uh, if we assume that this uh, observation matrix um, has linearly uh, independent uh, uh, columns. Um, all right, so just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what these equalities and inequalities look like, uh, this is a more explicit expression. They look uh, something like this, and you see that in this particular case, uh, so we, we're trying to characterize the entries of eta and impose conditions on, on those entries of eta. We get here this sum of some of the components of eta and then a product, and then we're weighting this by the entries of the matrix beta, or in this case, the pseudo inverse. Um, and taking another sum, and uh, you know, there's a lot that we can say about this polynomial, such as, you know, what is the degree? So, uh, so how many times are we multiplying those components with each other, or also which parts are we adding with each other, and etc. The condition here is that this expression is larger than or equal to zero. And so this is just for the inequalities that come from that uh, polyhedral cone that I mentioned previously. Um, but uh, we can get the full description if we also take the equations into, into consideration and the inequalities that come from the state action uh, frequency simplex, which are linear. Right, so then next, um, we, let me mention a bit about the number and location of critical points. Um, and this is using um, the statements that I showed you in a, a moment ago and um, so once we have uh, the semi-algebraic description of the feasible set, uh, turns out that we can use tools of polynomial optimization to draw conclusions about the number of critical points. And uh, the idea is um, conceptually uh, relatively simple. Uh, we simply formulate the KKT conditions or the Lagrange conditions. Let's say we look at a particular side of our uh, feasible set. So we choose uh, which inequalities are going to be active and uh, we look at the corresponding um, equality constraint optimization problem. And, and we formulate the, the Lagrange criterion. So this gives us an equation and we can try to boil this down and, and try to investigate the properties of that. So this is gonna be a, a polynomial optimization problem. And based on that, we can, we can say something about how many times uh, we can expect generically that, um, uh, that there would be solutions. So this is, um, this is based on results by me and Rannerstadt that have been uh, very influential to our uh, investigations lately. 
Um, but um, so so here is the the idea. So we look at um, a subset of um, pairs of actions and observations, and um, so that corresponds to a phase of the polytope of um, observation policies. And it also corresponds to a phase of the feasible set of state action frequencies. Uh, so, and um, for that, uh, we get these equations and um, we can look at the degree uh, of the corresponding um, functions that determine those um, constraints. And based on that, uh, using the results of the end runner star, we can establish bounds on the number of critical points. And they end up looking like this for a particular choice of a phase of the set. So I will spare you the discussion of all these little details, um, um, but that's something that we were very pleased about to be able to tell how many critical points we may expect. Um, I should point out that, uh, so this bound that I'm presenting here is sort of the simplest possible one. And we have worked on some other cases and uh, there is a follow-up uh, more recent work uh, with Dresler, Carote, Lopez and Rose uh, looking at a particular case when the uh, observations are deterministic and, and trying to see what happens in that setting. But also, uh, this is this result here is not necessarily exploiting the specific properties of the polynomials that we have at hand. And if we try to exploit the specific properties, so this multilinear or multi-homogeneous structure, then it, it, in some cases it is possible to further improve those bounds. And that's actually a program that we are um, also currently very interested in. Uh, okay, I, I can also remark that, uh, so this is, you know, how difficult is it to, to look at the optimization in a particular side of the feasible set. And by these results um, from previously, we can also restrict our attention to only a subset of the sides um, of the feasible set. So that means that maybe we don't need to consider so many uh, critical points at the end. Um, all right, so let me then quickly show you a few experiments. So an idea here uh, that came up was that, okay, once we have this feasible set described, uh, then why not uh, carry out the policy optimization as a constraint optimization problem with a linear objective? And there's an algorithm called the uh, ROSA, reward optimization in state action space. And it does precisely what I just mentioned. So if you have given a, um, partially observable Markov decision process, um, we can extract from it uh, the corresponding constraints and uh, conduct uh, this constraint optimization using any constraint optimization method that you like. Here again, um, we have been looking lately at um, polynomial optimization uh, tools and then some of the nice packages that, um, that people have developed uh, in, in the algebraic um, community um, for homotopy continuation and, and tracking solutions and things like that. But but one may also use other, other techniques, uh, any interior point method um, to solve the constraint optimization problem. Uh, motivation for this is that um, the problems can be very ill conditioned. Um, if you look at, if you, if you consider the parametric version of the problems and um, so this can end up leading to difficulties. So the Lipschitz constant may be blowing up um, and, uh, or it may be that if you have, a, in some cases, you don't want to have a, a very small discount factor, but large. So, that, and, um, so if you have a very high discount, then you will not be able to observe the worst that are far away. And so maybe it's desirable to have a large value of gamma and in those cases, one can end up having here difficulties with the condition number uh, or vanishing gradients. So um, in order to overcome this, one can do many things. Uh, one of them is to try and use Riemannian gradient methods or natural policy gradients, um, but this can be costly. And so maybe as an alternative, one just does the optimization in the state action frequency space. And the setting that we consider here was navigation in mazes. Um, we generated a bunch of random mazes and uh, determine a goal state. 
and the task um, was for an agent that was placed at some position at random to figure out um, how to reach a reward. Uh, and so if it wants to maximize the uh, accumulated reward over repetitions of this whole process, it will try to find the shortest um, path that will bring it to this reward or the shortest amount of steps. And uh, for the reasons that I mentioned previously, um, it may need to randomize also its actions. So we consider several baselines. One was direct policy optimization. This is um, just uh, parameterize these stochastic matrices and conduct um, policy gradient uh, with, uh, okay, you can use different modifications. We use here LBFGS. Um, there is another method that uses constraints that was proposed before. It is it's different from our method um, because it is looking at constraints on the value function. Um, but this is another interesting baseline that we looked at here. And uh, here's uh, what we observe. So if the number of states of the maze, we make these mazes bigger and bigger, we monitor the solution time. And ROSA is our method. Uh, it, you know, at least in this particular kind of problems, it uh, did perform best in the sense of requiring the least amount of time. Direct policy optimization became very expensive, not that this is logarithmic. And uh, BCP uh, was better, but um, not as good as, as ROSA. And also we were uh, looking here at uh, what was the return reward uh, at the end of the optimization. And uh, all of them perform similar in this case, so meaning that we require less time, but uh, the, the overall performance was similar. It's an illustration of what the mazes look like. Okay, next experiment was about this condition number. As I mentioned, when the discount factor gamma uh, goes closer to one, uh, the condition number deteriorates. And so we we're interested in seeing if we had benefits um, for the stability of the optimization. Uh, so we look here at the discount factor and um, what happens with the solution time. So here ROSA remained pretty, pretty stable even when the discount factor becomes uh, very, very close to one. And BCP does well most of the time, but then it also starts uh, becoming unstable and direct policy optimization was terrible um, for large values of gamma. It, um, it took a very long time. And also if we look at the return rewards. So here higher is better because we're trying to maximize the reward. So BCP and ROSA did comparatively well, uh, but direct policy optimization achieved only a much lower reward. So it was not able to optimize the objective. Okay, so let me come to a conclusion. Um, so I presented a uh, discussion of discounted um, state action frequencies um, in partially observable Markov decision processes. And um, I discussed uh, how they uh, are rational functions of the policy entries. If we look at memoryless stochastic policies, um, and the degree of these uh, rational functions uh, depends on the degree of observability. Something similar happens um, for the expected reward or also for the value function. Then uh, the feasible state action frequencies uh, form a basics and algebraic set, and we can formulate a polynomial programming um, formulation of the POMDP uh, problem. And based on this, we can bound a number of critical points of the reward, and we can formulate algorithms that have some benefits um, and some tasks. There's a lot of uh, interesting work that we're working on these days and, um, and other things that we hope to, to be able to take a look in the future. So one, I already mentioned the algebraic optimization techniques uh, for sequential decision making, and we have a preprint. Uh, uh, don't want to miss the opportunity to advertise. Uh, so with Johannes and Kemal Rosemar, I could address that in Marina Garrote Lopez. Um, we also have a discussion about uh, policy optimization methods using policy gradient, and in particular, Nadro policy gradients. I have also a very recent preprint um, with Johannes on the geometry and convergence of natural policy gradients.
other things that are interesting from this perspective of a semi-algebraic description of feasible sets and what the optimization problem looks like are um, multi-agent settings. So when you have multiple agents, they may not all perceive the same, uh, even if um, in aggregate or all together, maybe they perceive the entire environment, but, but not every one of them um, separately. So it's an interesting case of partial observability, something we were looking at with um, Lidrich Fike and Johannes. Um, there is a lot of interesting work to be done in terms of um, exploiting the multi-homogeneous structure of the problem to obtain tighter bounds for the number of critical points, or also to refine the classes of policies um, that are guaranteed to contain maximizers of the reward. Um, so the results we have are optimal in a sense, but um, there are interesting um, uh, refinements uh, to be considered. Um, also, uh, the discussion that I presented today um, was about optimizing the policy and uh, without consideration of the estimation problem in the sense of um, the state transitions uh, or this instantaneous reward function. We are sort of assuming that we know what they are, but uh, in reinforcement learning applications, those are quantities that need to be estimated from experience. And so this introduces other uh, interesting uh, aspects to study. Moreover, I focus on policies with memory and we have a couple of ideas and, and things that we think would be very interesting to develop in the case that the policies have a memory. And also continuous spaces. So today I showed you uh, a discussion of finite state spaces and finite action spaces. Okay, so I will uh, stop here and um, happy to take any questions or discussion. Yes, Guido. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Uh, are there questions from the audience? Then let me maybe start with one uh, initial question. So is there some way to use uh, the results that you have to design efficient relaxations of the problem? Yes, uh, it's a really good uh question. Uh, indeed, some of the things that we have been exploring here in this algebraic optimization uh, case uh, are relaxations, because when you have these um, um, polynomial optimization problems, uh, the, the typical approach to solving them is via um, a relaxations. And um, uh, there is this hierarchy um, of, um, of problems that you can uh, try and solve. And um, uh, if you take a, an easy relaxation, uh, this is solved quickly. If you take a more complicated one, it is solved more slowly. And um, you know, we have made a couple of interesting observations as to how far you have to go into this hierarchy. And um, that uh, there are interesting, uh, interesting questions that uh, we have not fully figured out yet, but uh, that we think are very, very interesting. I should mention all this uh, relaxation and polynomial optimization is a big industry. And um, one where people are putting a lot of uh, energy and uh, yeah. So we're in a way, you know, um, trying to contribute to those developments, maybe more with the focus on the reinforcement learning or, or, or decision-making uh, setting. Um, but also are very attentive and interested in seeing uh, what uh, other specialists in that particular area uh, come up with. Okay. Uh, another question maybe, can you tell us something more about what, what happens when you go over to reinforcement learning? Uh, sure, uh, maybe... Um, um, Okay, let me see if I have any good slides in here. Mm. Um, okay, so do you have a particular question? Uh, no, no, no particular one, no. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, no worries. I suppose, uh, you know, I guess, uh, uh, oh, oh yeah, so maybe I can say like this. So if we know that, if you know exactly what is the transition mechanism in a Markov process, mm -hmm. you can in principle, you know, just compute the stationary distribution by uh, 
you know, computing some matrix inverse. Uh, and uh, so in a way, the discussion that we're doing is, is saying, all right, uh, we, we assume that we have access to that, to that value. In real life, you don't know exactly what is this transition probability. So you actually cannot compute uh, that stationary distribution a priori. There are certain obvious things that you can do. You can take the plug-in estimator of those transition probabilities. Uh, you just start filling in you know, the frequencies at which you have observed a particular transition and you use that instead. And in fact, many of the algorithms that are applied in practice do something like that. Like if you take, um, uh, so let's say we have this function here. So maybe an obvious thing that you could do is just you know, look at the trajectory over a fixed amount of time and use you know whatever were the frequencies that you had, uh, you know, as your estimate for the expectation value. Um, but but that estimation aspect is uh, becomes relevant. And I suppose uh, you know the whole discussion that I did here, in a way, it is not affected except for the fact that um, yeah. So it's as if you know, in one case you. In principle, you have access to a function. In the other case, maybe you have, in principle, only access to some samples of the function. OK. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. If there are no more questions from the audience, uh, I would like to thank you again for uh, speaking in the seminar and giving a very nice talk. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, my pleasure. And uh, of course, I mean, if, if anyone comes up with um, thoughts or ideas that they would like to discuss, uh, please, I'm happy to. Um, yes, and uh, as said, this was the final seminar of this semester. We will continue next semester. Uh, the first slot uh, is on January the 12th. That's in the America slot. Uh, and the first... Uh, Europe, Asia, Euro, Africa slot is on January 26th. So very nice. Thank you. <laughs>